And the work that he's done in his life have a lot to do with why I'm here today. And I thought I would share with you kind of the story of how I got engaged in this movement for justice. Um, my parents were um, from Germany, from Berlin, where they lived a, a good middle class life with their extended family. And slowly, the power of the state started inexplicably to be turned against them as German Jews. Slowly, the immigrant, uh, the Nuremberg law slowly got implemented. You know, Jews couldn't have vegetable gardens. They couldn't have pets. They couldn't swim in public pools. Uh, Jewish doctors couldn't serve non-Jewish patients. Jewish musicians could not pay, play for non-Jewish audiences. Slowly, slowly, um, and they began to see their world and their fatherland, which they deeply identified with and love, become their enemy. Uh, my, my father was a window dresser, my mother was a seamstress. Uh, they were able to go to Holland, to Amsterdam, and open up a business. But many of their relatives never got out. The few that did, my sister is a genealogist, has chased them around the world. Some went to Shanghai and have ended up now in Australia. Some went to England and some to uh, uh, um, Israel. Other Jews went to Cuba, Argentina. Um, like immigrants today, they scattered to save their lives. And then the, German, the Dutch Nazi party opened an office next to my parents' business in Amsterdam, and they felt it was time to leave. And they were part of the lucky few, having a, wel a wealthy relative living in the United States who was willing to sponsor them. Because at that time, you couldn't immigrate unless there was someone who would vow to support you financially, so you never became a dependent of the state and they were able to come to the United States. Um, one grandmother never left and ended up dying in a concentration camp with her sister. My other grandmother died um, while being hidden by a family in Holland. Um, and so my sister and I grew up in the United States surrounded by other people who had shared this experience of dislocation and oppression and who had just scraps of family that were left, and they would come together socially for the holidays and try to recreate a sense of family. Um, and I was raised with this sense of fear that, not that it was communicated directly by my parents, but that the world could turn against you, but not for any reason that you could understand. The government could decide that your kind of person, your gender, your ethnicity, your religion, your race, was the enemy. And the world was a rather scary place. And uh, when I tried to share some of my family's experience with uh, especially young um, American Jews or other people in the Jewish community, there really was very little knowledge of what happened in Europe. People just didn't understand it. And as I got, when I got older and I met left-wing Jews, they were angry that the German Jews hadn't fought back, as if it's so easy to fight against a fascist state that's out to destroy you. Well, I went um, to college, to Berkeley, and I found that I gravitated immediately to the civil rights movement, similar to Jerry Stinson's story. I, I joined CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and I think looking back on it, partly, it was that the people in CORE also felt at risk. And the risk was present right now. But they had figured out a way to fight back. And that was something that drew me. And it was the nonviolent training that was brought to the Civil Rights Movement by Reverend Lawson that I was trained in by CORE that taught me how to fight back in an effective way without being a force for violence. And I got involved in large demonstrations um, around against Lucky Markets, against the Sambo uh, restaurant chain, if any of you remember that, a racist uh, thing. That I, it was all about hiring rights for African Americans because 
those jobs were not open to African Americans. My first big hotel demonstration was at the Sheraton Plaza Hotel in San Francisco around equal hiring rights. And then I turned 18 and I was eligible to commit civil disobedience. <laughs> The next big demonstration was aimed at the auto dealerships on Van Ness in San Francisco. And one after another, these, these um, automobile dealerships were lined up. And there were about 400 people per, uh, participating in this event. And I was assigned to the Chrysler showroom. I went into the Chrysler shop showroom with my colleagues. I slid under the Chrysler Imperial and I went limp. <laughs> and that night, throughout the entire night, the San Francisco police had to go into every showroom and drag out completely nonviolent and friendly, but completely passive, uh, demonstrators and put us in jail. We went into in the black caddy wagons, went to jail, and were released the next morning, charged with failure to disperse, disturbing the peace, and trespassing. And that summer, which was 1964, we were tried in groups of 10, and we pretty much clogged up the court system in the city of San Francisco. And each of our groups of 10 was given a pro bono attorney, and the attorney representing my group uh, was an African-American man. And his defense, which he presented uh, in the courtroom, uh, in our defense, was the history of civil disobedience in the making of the American democracy. <laughs> so I got my education in the significance, the historical significance of civil disobedience. But even more important was during the lunch breaks, because this went on the entire summer, where I learned that this lawyer had been in Europe at the liberation of a concentration camp. And he had, he actually understood the experience that my family had gone through. And I realized this week that he was in a segregated military unit because the U.S. Army was not integrated yet. So he was in an all-black unit and he was present. And he and I spent the summer talking with our broken German, eating liverwurst and pumpernickel, and he brought my worlds together. And I'd say that that cemented my commitment to social justice, but also my understanding that this was a place for my safety. This was a place where I could fight for human rights, for groups of people in, a, in the United States, but it was fighting for my own rights. And I think that for everyone in this room, there's a way in which you feel at risk as well. That this is a, a big country that's part of a global economic system where individuals are often disregarded, and we're different in many ways, and many people feel at risk. So this movement, as much as it's selfless, and someone can say, you know, you've lived a really good life fighting for other people. I know this has been a movement about fighting for my own safety. And so when we demonstrate together and we organize together, we're building bonds of trust. And we can rely on each other when we need each other. So I want to thank everybody who's here in this room are some of the most brilliant organizers in the city of Los Angeles, some of the most courageous religious leaders in the city of Los Angeles. People who come from all different parts of my organizing life, from the Ocean Park Community Center, working on homeless issues, the city of Santa Monica, trying to turn a government into the People's Republic. <laughs> Locally, Levin, all my dear friends and colleagues and in people who inspire me at Lane. And of course, all the leadership, the board of CLU, and all the people that CLU touches, and all the workers who have stood up in Los Angeles in this collective movement where we've marched together to transform our city. So it's been a great life, and I really recommend it. <laughs>
staff and volunteers who have made today's Giants of Justice breakfast possible. A special thank you to our Giants of Justice coordinator, Nicole Brown. And to our volunteer coordinators, staff organizers, Gabriella Roscoe and Elizabeth Russell. offer a closing blessing. Adonai Ebarev et Amo Bashalom. 
May God bless his people with strength and bless us all with shalom, with peace and wholeness. Que Dios bendiga su gente con valentía, con fuerza, y nos bendiga con shalom, con paz, con plenitud. Gracias, Torraba. Thank you. Shalom.